everyone. Thank you for taking the time today in your busy schedules to join us for today's session. I know for some of you, there will be uh, this will be going into your evenings, so we really appreciate you being flexible as we work around the time zones. Today, I'm speaking to you from Japan, and we'll be shortly be joined by our, by our amazing panelists based in Singapore, New York, and the Bay Area. Before we get started, a quick introduction about me. I am Caroline, and I will be your moderator for today. I work as Chief Global Officer at the Hoffman Agency, which is a specialist B2B tech communications consultancy. But for today, I come to you wearing my second hat as a member of the Global Advisory Board for the PRCA. Prior to that, I was one of the co-chairs for the PRCA APAC region, where I specialize in creating educational content for audiences around Asia communications. So let's get started. Asia is already the world's largest and most populated content, continent. It accounts for about 35 to 40% of the world's economy. And where once upon a time, cookie cutter communication strategies leveraging global materials might have been effective in creating some movement. These days, Asian companies are becoming bolder, individualistic, and even more demanding. They want to be recognized for their backgrounds, cultures, customs, ethnicities, and even digital chops. This means that the landscape is highly fragmented and nuanced. It's not cheap or subservient, but it is hungry for success. Earlier this year, my group within the PRCA launched an Asia go-to-market primer as the first port of call to explore what this means for communications. And today I'm delighted to be joined by three incredible panelists to offer some real life strategies and insights into how to effectively cross these borders and move the needle in the region. So let's welcome our panelists for today. Uh, first up is Dixon Xiu Xiao, and he's an international communication consultant who has led regional and global communication programs for some of the world's most recognized names in tech, including Apple, Google, PayPal, Twitter, and most recently, Discord. Second up is Aline Anneliker, and she is our uh, a strategic communications and integrated marketing expert with two decades of experience in agency and in-house roles across Europe, the US, and Asia. She spent the last 10 years living in Singapore and Indonesia and specializes in cross-cultural comms. And finally, we have Amy Freeland. She is the Vice President of Marketing Communications at OceanX, a nonprofit specializing in deep sea exploration. The company recently announced a multi-year mission to explore the oceans in Southeast Asia and is currently navigating its way through Singaporean, Indonesian, and Malaysian waters as we speak. Thank you for everyone for being here today. So let's get started. Dave uh, Dixon, uh, why don't we start with you? What are some of the biggest myths or misconceptions that international companies have when entering the Asian markets? Great. All right, thanks, Carolyn. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, have a conversation with the panelists, and also hopefully have a chance to answer some questions as well from the participants later. Uh, so I think you bring up a very good point, and I guess it is the main topic of the webinar today, right, is what are the myths that people have about Asia Pacific region. So I've got a few I can talk about and I'm happy to pass around to other panelists and then they can share as well. Um, I guess the first one really is, you know, people think that Asia Pacific is this homogenous region, right? And that what you do in Japan can easily work in Australia or India. And I think for all those of us who've been in the region for a couple of decades, you, you also know that that's not, the, that's not the truth. You know, what does work in one market actually may not work in others. A lot of it really depends on um, cultural nuance. It's not even just the languages that, that are different, but the preferences for local um, societies, users, uh, the way governments want to be able to engage, 
uh, how businesses want to do business with you, right? So um, I think that first point where, you know, you must have local cultural knowledge really to be successful uh, in each market is uh, an important myth buster. And then I'd say the second myth is, I guess the opposite of that is that, uh, you know, people think that Asia is actually very difficult because you have very fragmented markets and you have to have a unique different approach to every market, which can be very expensive, right? And, you know, I've had conversations with CEOs where they just don't want to tackle the region because they think that there's just 12, 13 different versions of a product that you have to build in order to reach the, the users in this region. And that's not true. I think you also can have a very common product, but the way that you tell the stories, the way that you make it culturally relevant is how you differentiate per, per market. Okay. And I think that the third myth is, I guess, speaking because I work with a lot of US companies, uh, US companies very naturally go first to Europe. And so they're very familiar with EMEA and EU. And um, the myth there is that Asia Pacific is like the EU, which is not true, right? Uh, while the EU has a very common regulatory framework, people are very familiar with GDPR, for example. When you come to Asia and Asia Pacific, the regulatory frameworks are very unique, very different. And so again, taking the time to understand um, how each government wants to be engaged, the policies that are important for them, right? Again, very different between like South Korea or Indonesia um, or New Zealand, right? But taking the time to really understand that, maybe choosing one or two markets really to go deep in first before you try to tackle the entire region is the advice that, that I'd give. Uh, I'm happy to stop there and open up to anyone else if they want to talk about any myths that they've faced. When they yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Dixon. Um, Aline, what about you? I mean, do you agree with some of this or what are your, you know, some of your insights in this area? Sure. Hello, everyone. What a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much. Hoping to pass on some valuable insights today. And yes, would love to build on Dixon's point, um, which I fully agree with. I think what goes or plays into what he just mentioned about, you know, there's no like one Asia or one size fits all is the misconception that I, you know, face time and again that people from outside of Asia think that English is actually widely spoken and understood. So marketing messages in English, you know, are just fine. Um, I think if I'm up to date on my research, Asia comprises roughly 50 countries and about 2,300 languages um, with, I think, Chinese and Hindi being the most widely spoken. So, you know, my advice, you have to translate and not only translate, but also tailor and localize the message to communicate successfully. That would be my first one. And then another one that I face time and again in my past uh, roles, as well as in my advisory capacity to large corporations, that many companies, especially if they are headquartered in Europe or in the US, think that execution by the global team is just fine. So let's say your comms department is located in, in the US headquarter, for example, um, and you think you can just roll out or launch whatever right out of, of your headquarters. And I think you really need to have local people on the ground who truly understand the local preferences, the nuances and sensitivities. It's not possible to operate in a fully global structure without um, people on site, so to speak. Thanks, Alan. Yes, I think the takeaway is, you know, Asia is just not one region and there's a lot of cultural nuances mm -hmm. um, coming both from um, you and Dixon. So maybe we move to Amy here, you know, as the freshest off the boat, <laughs> no pun intended. I'd love to, you know, get your take in terms of what is the biggest surprise for you when you started working out here in Asia and um, how did you and your organization adapt to that? Thank you. Yeah, I am very new to the region. Um, we just, OceanX just launched our work in um, Southeast Asia earlier this year. So I am still learning quite a bit about the region. And um, throughout our work, we, we've been so far in Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and I'd say it's been a crash course in the nuance. Um, I think the biggest surprise for me so far, and I'm sure there's more around the corner, is that um, there's a real hunger for communication partnership. So as the person who's leading communication and is at an organization that works quite closely with philanthropic and governmental partners, um, we have found a great willingness to 
collaborate and find ways to communicate together for the benefit of both entities, which that's been a really rewarding experience for me. I think it's not only been a chance to learn about the preferences and what works well from my partners and from uh, the the um, agencies that we work with within the region. It's also been just a great personal learning experience about how to navigate this sort of nuance. Um, we are, we're still adapting though. OceanX, I think is, um, we're a startup kind of organization. So we're adapting at a large scale, but really learning how to fit within Southeast Asia and how to communicate effectively. Um, so I would say in general, these local relationships have been completely key. That has been um, the thing that has helped us the most to understand the cultural nuance, how the governments and the, the press entities all interact to understand um, uh, just how to be polite and, and how to be respectful within each different market. Um, but it's also been many late nights. And and I think to Eileen's point, a realization that we need local staff to be able to do this effectively. Um, and that's something we're pursuing now. And I think will really help. Thanks, Amy. Yes, definitely. I think, you know, uh, some people out, uh, you know, in Western markets, they, they definitely, you know, feel like out here as opposed to Western markets, you know, when it comes to kind of collaborating with a government and different ent entities, it, it, it's definitely something that that uh, needs to be looked at, you know, as opposed to kind of Western states, so to speak. So I'm going to come back to you a bit, Aline. Can you relate to this in your earlier days out here? Maybe you could share some of your personal experiences. In yes, there. absolutely. I, I, I grew up in Europe and then I moved to the US for a little while and then to Asia. So when I moved to Asia about 10 years ago, I think it was the little things that, you know, kept surprising me time and again, and sometimes still do, right? I have to admit, it's a constant learning. Um, but to build on Amy's point on the personal relationships, right? It's a trust-based area. It's not a transactional region so to speak so yes relationships are everything and to build this relationship things might work a bit differently so you know from little things as I just said from passing on your business card with both hands for example you know these little things or um, yesterday I had a presentation uh, with Japanese stakeholders and, you know, they kind of close their eyes and you think, oh, my God, is my presentation so boring or they're just, you know, super <laughs> tired. But no, for Japanese people, if you are aware, it actually means if they close their eyes that they're paying really like full attention. They're intensely listening. So it's actually showing respect and interest. So it's these little cultural things that, you know, kept surprising me coming from a Western uh, background and I think it's really important to you know just be aware of at least that things might work differently um, not to be surprised too much once you start dealing with let's say customers or government or stakeholders and then just to add on one more point what also was a bit of, su of a surprise to me initially was that actually um, some of the biggest understandings sometimes happen between the Asian colleagues from different countries because Let's take Singapore, where I'm, I'm based right now. It's a small island, which is 6 million people, but a very diverse uh, population made up of Chinese, Malay, Indians, and many more, and four national languages just here in Singapore. So when I moved here, I realized, you know, sometimes the misunderstandings or not knowing how to um, successfully move forward in another Asian market actually happens within the Asian people as well. So it's not only, you know, between West and East, for example. I love that, Aline. Yeah, I, I can really relate to what you just said. In fact, you know, just being out here, I'm in Tokyo this week, I literally had to explain to um, um, clients how to bow and take take over the name card, to your point. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, some of these things do definitely come surprising even to our, you know, different colleagues that are sitting out here in Asia. So I definitely can relate there. But um, moving maybe back to Dixon for a little bit, you know, we're talking about cultural nuances here. And one thing we can't really avoid out here in Asia is geopolitics, right? Um, Dixon, you used to work at Twitter, um, which was kind of well known as a place for activism. Um, how do you adapt your strategies? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, if I take a step back a little bit, um, I guess cultural nuances is, is the magic, right, of communications across any region. Um, again, all the markets have different preferences. You talk to a user in Japan who would like a very clean interface when they're using your product, I'm talking about tech digital products, to maybe someone in Indonesia where they prefer to have something a little more flashy, more things to do on it, right? Um, so understanding those cultural nuances is super important um, in order to like really understand how to communicate your company's mission, your product benefits to each market that you want to enter, okay? Uh, I'd say just on the question of um, activism, yeah, that is always one that's uh, very interesting and probably more in the realm of like public affairs, yeah. policy communications, which again, in the region like Asia Pacific is very important, right? Um, I think all communicators now, we know that it's not just about growing audience, growing your revenue, but also managing your brand reputation with regulators, right? And so uh, some regulators in the region are, are more willing to take a public position for or against your organization. Um, some prefer to do it behind closed doors. I think this is where you have to work very closely with your public policy um, colleagues and really figure out what's the right way to communicate this in public. Um, I think there are examples where if a company, sorry, a government is not able to reach you, you know, yeah. they will use the press as a way to kind of engage with you, right? Uh, which can be a very risky way to do communications. And obviously if you have um, a line of communications with governments, you know, or even with activists, right? They're able to deal with you behind closed doors, which I think most communications people would prefer yes, rather than have sure. um, public um, issues raised. Uh, so I think just making sure that you have um, strong relationships with local NGOs, with activists can really help strengthen your positions, especially when I deal with regulators um, and maybe sometimes even officially push back local governments. But uh, I think for Asia specifically, most people prefer to work with the governments um, and activists and try to understand both sets of opinions and try to be neutral as much as possible. Thanks, Dixon. Yes, I think, you know, definitely the sentiment has changed and it's really, you know, you can't, Put that aside, right? Coming into Asia, you do need to take into account kind of geopolitics and activism and kind of consider that in your communication strategies. Um, I think, um, you know, coming back to you, uh, Amy, for a bit, you know, Ocean X also speaks with many governments around the region, uh, especially when you're developing um, your missions. So what has it been like for you since, you know, arriving in Southeast Asia and working with all these different governments and entities? Yeah, well, you're right. Um, we, we can't do our work exploring the ocean without deep relationships with the government. So we've had um, a real opportunity to get to know different working styles, to get to understand very different approaches and relationships with press, um, thinking about publicity, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think it just anecdotally, my my entry was Singapore, which felt very familiar as a New Yorker. There yeah. was a there was a timeliness and an urgency and a, let's get things done that I found in Singapore that um, was different in Indonesia when we went on that mission. It's just a different approach and um, it required a bit of adaptation and an understanding that we may not have all of the plans cemented um, on the timeline I would prefer, but that's okay because we will we will get it where it needs to be by working closely with our partners. Um, I think a willingness to sort of go along for the ride has been helpful yeah. um, and to understand just what what our government partners want, uh, what their priorities are, and to find the ways to connect those with what we're trying to achieve as well. Um, that kind of negotiation and partnership seems to work well as long as everybody comes to the discussion in good faith. Yeah, I love that because, you know, here we are um, talking about APAC as a region, but actually even your experiences in just Southeast Asia alone, you could already see the cultural differences and, you know, the, the, the difference in speaking to different NGOs and partnership and governments. So, you know, definitely that just showcases what, what are the cultural nuances that you have to take into account. So, you know, really interesting things there. Um, 
if I can move on, maybe back to you, uh, Aline, you know, we're talking about cultural differences and market differences, but I'm sure you've seen a lot of organizations struggling with the battle in terms of how to prioritize the localization, especially of global brand messaging, and then trying to balance, you know, maintaining that global identity in such a diverse Asian environment, right? So what kind of advice do we have here in this Yes, Area, it's so it's a constant struggle also, you know, <laughs> internally, right, between the headquarters and the local um, subsidiaries, uh, trying to understand each other or not. <laughs> so, but I, I really, I believe nowadays more than ever, you should strike the right balance to keep, obviously, your brand's appearance and voice consistent, yet adaptable to, let's say, relevant conversations, relevant cultural nuances, but also industry industry, industry trends, apologies. Um, yeah. I think you should use your brand voice as a foundation, but maintain flexibility in your language, your tone to suit different mediums. And I think, you know, we can also talk uh, about that in a bit on channels and mediums um, and yeah. that might be different audiences, cultural nuances, whatnot. And um, yes, it is tricky to maintain a strong global brand while accounting for regional nuances, uh, especially in terms of wording, design, color, whatnot. So to give you a few examples, right, um, wording. I work a lot with companies on their purpose, vision, values, yeah. and some words like a value can't just simply be translated, let's say, word for word in Japanese, because the meaning then might actually be not what you want to convey. So you have to have a, a bit of room for adjustment here while maintaining, obviously, your corporate values, for example. And the same goes with colors. Some colors might not have any meaning in a culture, but they might have a positive or negative connotation in another country. And while we all know that we can't, you know, change a company's logo color, for example, we, however, might be able to, you know, do some local refinement, if you want to call it like that. For example, add a dab of red when you create a invitation for an event in China for like a customer event or so because red is really a strong positive color in China even though the color might not be used in the U.S. headquarter but I think you know it's not going to dilute the brand if the invitation card has a bit of red somewhere even though it's not your company color just some you know little flexibility where it doesn't hurt the brand identity. I love that. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, definitely keeping agility, flexibility in mind, I think is quite important. So I'm going to come back to you, Dixon, because, you know, would like your take here. I mean, you've led many international programs yourself. What is your approach to this? Yeah, uh, so I think it's interesting. I would agree with Aline on two elements of it. One is, you know, again, if we, we just take, take a step back, and I've been in both in the region as well as and Global HQ, looking at Asia Pacific, right? I think there's really two questions that we as communicators really have to help people understand about your company in any, any market, right? So one is, what does your company do? What do you stand for, right? And two really is, why should I use it, right? Again, I come from a tech yes. um, angle on these things. So... Uh, once you've identified that, I think that needs to be consistent all around the world, right? And again, how you say it um, can differ, but the core message must be the same, right? Because that platform is reflected everywhere around the world in the same way, the way people use, use it, okay? Uh, but I think the customization, the localization part is really about how you tell the story. And that's really through, you know, cultural moments, um, user voices, local data, right? All that ladders up still into the same brand message, right? Um, your company's purpose, uh, why people should use it, but how you tell the stories locally is um, where, again, people can decide, use that creativity and figure it out. Some markets data is very important. Um, and I have to explain this to people sometimes at headquarters that a global data set doesn't mean anything to someone in India. You yes. need to have India data to talk to the Indian press, Indian users, Indian regulators, right? So um, even when you come to um, cultural nuances, you know, I like to have my teams build cultural calendars for each market, 
that we are trying to target. Because um, Diwali, for example, in India is very different from another national holiday in another market, right? Um, and of course, the user voices. I mean, that's something that's super important to be able to reflect human interest stories in local markets. Um, just even on a regional perspective, if you think about uh, gender equality, a lot of markets in Asia now where gender equality become very important, right? Uh, telling more stories with women's voices, right? women empowerment, uh, women leaders, that's maybe more important in Asia than other regions uh, where maybe gender equality isn't such a big issue yet, right? So a lot of this really understand the societies, um, societal trends, and then figuring out what the local stories are that ladder back up into an overall brand message that's consistent around the world. I love all the examples. Thanks, Dixon. Yeah, I think, you know, the point here is really, it it is uh, it is possible to kind of still have a core message and the brand identity from corporate, but just allowing for those localizations and for those um, uh, 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 allowing a conversation with local teams, right? And picking those right moments and, and right stories to tell. Um, Amy, if I come back to here, any additional thoughts, um, you know, as a, a brand going through this learning process, literally as we're speaking? Well, I think in some ways we're lucky on this because we are a brand that's in startup mode and has a degree of flexibility. Um, and so we've been lucky in that as we're learning the Southeast Asian market and, and Asia more broadly, we're actually able to kind of integrate that thinking into our overall brand approach. That's not standard for a brand that's entering the market, but that's been our experience. Um, but I think for us, and something Dixon said, it, it really did resonate with me for us, we try to find the local voices and we work closely with local partners and nonprofits um, on our work. So highlighting their work with us helps to localize the story of the work that OceanX is doing and making sure that we're driving home the impact that that can have for, yes, the ocean environments, but also for the communities that are local to the area. This is uh, work that really can matter to everyone. And we try to tell those stories effectively so that people can understand um, that we're here to be additive to the culture, not to, to take over with our own brand. Thanks so much, Amy. I mean, really as a fellow Asian, we really appreciate the relevancy, you know, and, and um, allowing for that. So really appreciate that. Caroline, may I add just a, yes, a thought that just came to my mind, which I, because we talked about adjusting strategies, brand, whatnot, just a, a really tangible example that came to my mind was a luxury product that was tailored around uh, Lunar New Year, which is the Chinese New Year that, you know, recurs every year for the Chinese people. Um, and they launched a animal themed uh, luxury item um, around the, the Lunar New Year because the, the Chinese zodiac changes every year, right? So, you know, let's just make it up. It's Let's say it's Louis Vuitton and all of a sudden they launch a bag with uh, one of the, you know, the next Chinese zodiac. So it's not going to dilute the, the strong Louis Vuitton brand with the pattern we all know, but for the Chinese uh, market or the Asian market where Lunar New Year is celebrated. It was a huge hit that they launched a bag with the with the next Chinese uh, zodiac. So this I find is a very good example about you know keeping your brand, uh, keeping your tone, your voice, but adjust the strategy and, and and you know speak to the audience in the market. Yeah, I love that, Ali. I mean, I'll even add to that in that you know. Um, uh, with the Lunar New Year example, honestly, you know, it's not even just the Zodiac. I've seen how certain companies really up at the next level and be able to then localize it for what is a Singaporean uh, market yeah, sure. know, versus China versus uh, Hong Kong versus Taiwan. Yes, so sure. even amongst the Chinese speaking mm. audiences, mm. there's minor nuances Lovely. in that. And I find that, wow, that's a next level yeah. up, so to speak. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. I think, you know, if we come back a little bit, you know, talking about brand messages and brand values, you know, maybe I come back to you, Dixon. I think something our audience would really appreciate and find it interesting is really looking at the varying levels of press freedom and influence really across all the Asian um, markets. So apart from Twitter, you were most recently at Discord um, and 
brands like that are all about the freedom of speech. So how should companies really approach building these relationships, especially with the media, and then, you know, while trying to uphold their core values? Great. Okay, that, that, that's a great question. And uh, I'm going to take it at a very high level to avoid if any, anyone's sensibilities on this call. Obviously, freedom of speech is very important for American companies. Um, but freedom of speech has varying levels of interpretation around the world, especially even within the Asia Pacific region. Okay. Um, so maybe first I'd say just philosophically, when you engage with local media, right, they are obviously citizens of the country. They're very proud of their country. Right? And so I think just understanding that as a, either a foreign company um, entering a new market, you know, uh, showing some respect for the country's sovereignty, or their cultural norms, their ways of doing business, um, even if it's different from your own company values, right? Yeah. Um, that humility really goes a long way, especially in Asian culture, right? Yeah. Um, now, obviously, part of the decision that every company has, and even communications team, is do you want to operate in a, in a country that has values that maybe doesn't fit your company values? That's more of a business decision, right? Yes. But obviously, that's part of, um, you know, whether you want to uh, do business in this market or not. Um, and freedom of speech obviously is one of those core values, right? For for some companies to think about. And second, I'd say, um, and maybe this is not very well known, but in some markets, uh, there is a, as, especially an American company, you you actually start off with a trust deficit. That's um, like the local media don't trust you, right? They don't know you, uh, especially if they have local competitors that you try to compete against, right? Um, and you know, obviously, competition uh, means that you're trying to beat the local yes, that's um, player, right? Yeah. So, just in in in, in some markets, again, uh, without naming names, you know, you just have to be sensitive to that. You know, they're usually sometimes trying to find a story that's negative on you, and so as communications professionals, right, our job is to um, build those relationships, those media relationships, tell them our side of the story, build some trust there, so that we can balance out those stories. Right. You're not always going to get the positive story, right? But as you know, professionals, you know, our job is really to, uh, you know, let these uh, media know that we're not here to conquer, right? We're here to be part of society, to um, uh, contribute to the success of the country as well, and bring value to users and businesses. Okay. Uh, and then I think, um, you know, I would also say that for some of the more forward-looking organizations they actually start with that when they get into a country, that they want to build reputation credit first before they think about introducing their products, um, opening um, offices there. Like how do you build this reputation credit with the media? Because they're influencers themselves on governments, users and stuff like that. So that's, that's a very um, interesting approach because it requires advanced investment. Um, and sometimes some companies aren't in a position to, to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'd say just, uh, and I'll just close it up with the freedom of speech thing. Uh, I know for some people, they feel it's a basic right. Um, yeah. You know, we have to be able to help these companies, especially U.S. companies, navigate the various levels of freedom of speech within um, each market. You know, I'd say, some, for example, some uh, markets, you're allowed to um, push back publicly on government policies. And in some yeah. markets, that's actually a taboo. You, you really can't do that. So... The most important thing actually is having a local agency or someone on the ground who could really help you understand what these nuances are, right? So that you don't create a PR disaster for yourself by thinking yeah. you're doing the right thing for your company values, but it's not um, consistent with the local cultural norms. So um, having a, a good agency to start off with, because obviously hiring people is very expensive, to start with a good agency, really understands what's happening in the market and give you that right advice and then listening to it is very important to navigate stuff like freedom of speech. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it brings back to some of the comments earlier that you know Amy and Aileen has made, which is in it comes to respect and you know just kind of coming to it at, at at that you know human level and working with local agencies or local partners in able to kind of um, use the press as a medium, um, so to speak. So really appreciate um, your insights there. Um, Aline, Amy, if any one of you want to add to that.
I think, um, again, for us, we, we've we been uh, quite lucky to work with press and with closely with governments and the relationship varies. Um, but as long as we make sure our partners objectives and, and messaging is aligned or or is um you know fitting well with ours we've found that you can navigate uh the relationships with the press quite well so it's about it's about coming to um an approach i think that works really well for the people you're working closely with and then mm -hmm. go forward together at least yeah. so far for us thanks amy so maybe I switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about just communications in the traditional sense, but we also know that um, Asia really is a rapidly evolving digital landscape. It's also very diverse. So Ali, maybe I, I pose this question to you. How can companies really stay agile and ahead of these trends um, in their comm strategies? What's your take? Right. And I think digital nowadays is close to our hearts if we work yes. in marketing or communication or PR. Yes. Um, I think, you know, one of the trends, the mega trends actually that you can see here, but actually across the world is what we call sometimes digital living, right? The consumers can now effortlessly navigate both the physical and the digital realms across all areas of their lives. So obviously that's a trend to, you know, follow and keep in mind as international companies. But as I briefly mentioned earlier already, right, if we talk um, kind of hands on about the digital landscape um, and the, the, the channels, how we want to reach our audience, um, so many international companies are not aware of the fact that we have so many different mediums and channels here in Asia. And, you know, I, I don't blame them by no means. I, I wasn't aware either before it's I moved here. <laughs> right. It's a lot. And then, you know, you start working like Amy with one or two or three markets, uh, moving on, building on it and realizing time and again, oh, my goodness, there's yet another channel we have to master. We <laughs> have to build knowledge around. So, you know, just to name a few, for example, Thailand uses Line, WeChat for China, then South Korea, totally different with Kakao, only to name a few on top on, you know, what's quite familiar on LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok. Um, so this really requires a platform specific strategy approach, and then also crafting your creatives, your content to the platform and to the audiences. So I think it's super important to, you know, initially be aware of this and then really master and, and, and leverage those different channels appropriately if you want to communicate successfully. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, to add on, I would also say, you know, talking with um, um, uh, Westerners, I, I often, you know, explain that if you have YouTube, you have Google, you have all these other platforms in, in uh, Western markets, there's equivalent, equivalents of all of that not just across Asia, but in each and every single market in Asia. And so, you know, it's that complicated, right? Um, so maybe, you know, I come back to Amy for a bit because I've, I've seen how Ocean X um, having a really a strong um, social media presence and, and doing a lot in this area. So what is your strategy in um, managing this Asian landscape? Well, we're smaller, right? We're not a huge multinational with large teams and, and the ability to execute across any social media channel that is the most popular in any particular country. So we have to take a bit of a different approach um, as we grow and as we enter new markets. But one thing that's been key for us is to identify the local influencers who are really respected and mission aligned and to work with them, use their, their megaphones to help get our story out there and to also build that relationship with them so they understand the work that we're doing. So I think that has been helpful for us. Um, we are looking at translation models, that is key. I think that's something that we can bring into our existing channels without adding additional channels right away, but it's a long-term uh, approach that we have to take in terms of our capacity to support all of these channels in the right strategic way with the right language 
adaptations. And so for us, it's working with the people who already have that audience and see how we can adapt our message through their channels. Thanks, Amy. I think, you know, sometimes less is more. You know, I think you brought up two points. One is less is more, you know, you're very focused, but, you know, it makes a difference. And I love the fact that you brought out the influencers and, and you know, we call them KOLs out here. Um, and that's like opening up another whole bucket and area to dive into, right? So a lot of nuances there. So thank you for sharing. Um, Dixon, anything to add before kind of we move to wrap up and move into the Q&A? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Like I agree with Aline and Amy. I think when you look at the Asia Pacific region, demographically, right, it's the youngest region, right? There are just more young people here. They're all digital natives, right? It's got the highest percentage of mobile users, internet users, and other regions. So you have to meet people where they are, right? Um, that's not to say traditional press hasn't lost its influence, but I think in this region, social media platforms uh, play like an even bigger role in order to connect with the Gen Z or millennial audience, right? And so um, when you look at, um, you know, working closely with social media teams, for example, out here in the States, you know, social media teams are separate from the comms team. Yeah. But I think in Asia, there's definitely value having the comms team and social, social media teams working very closely together. I'm not advocating that comms people run social media channels, right? Yes. Although that does happen, right? Yes. Uh, but I think just understanding that, you know, those two channels with traditional media and social media and more so social media in Asia, say in other regions, is important to have alignment on messaging, alignment on strategies, alignment on the story that you want to tell so you can engage with that young audience, right? And um, obviously for environmental concerns, right? The younger <laughs> Gen Z millennial audience yes. care about that a lot. So I can understand why, you know, social media channels be very poor for Amy. Yeah, honestly, I think uh, if we continue on, this would be like another hour in itself to get through all the nuances and whatnot. So um, before we get to the last question, I would encourage everyone um, on the call to just ping the uh, Q&A uh, over and we'll get to that in a bit. So maybe one final question to really wrap up before moving to Q&A is if we could quickly go around to all three of you and really you know, share your experiences for market entry into Asia, any tips, um, things like that. So maybe we start with you, Amy. Sure, I think um, right now my, my biggest tip is to stay humble, um, really lean on local partners, local agencies, make sure you have the local expertise supporting you because there is a lot to learn and you shouldn't go into Asia thinking you know it all. You, you're going to have an experience and a growth opportunity for yourself as well as for your organization. Love it. Um, Aline, what about you? That would have yeah. been my point as well. So thank you, okay. Amy. Um, I think to build up uh, on that, uh, just you know, being aware that there is no one size fits all and that there are differences. I think that's half of the journey on the road to success. So once you're aware, right, that's, that's a lot already. Um, yes, as Amy said, closely collaborate with people on the ground. If you don't have people from your own organization there yet, you know, doesn't matter. I'm sure you can find agencies, partners, whatever to help you work through and, you know, not just to roll it out or launch it from the headquarters, but to include the local people beforehand to really properly successfully address your audience. Um, and then I think just, you know, carefully listen and listen again and reflect and ask clarifying questions so you can really understand your target audience's needs or you know desires um, and not target audience Asia but specific to a country so I think the, the listening part and reflecting part is, is quite uh, helpful as well. Awesome thank you for that. Dixon you're up next and we'll jump into your Q&A. Okay great so listen I, I'd say that um, you know, if you ask me for my final comment, I'd say the Asia Pacific region is very exciting. There are many, many opportunities, whether it's again from Japan to India to New Zealand, everything in between. If you think about it, the majority of the world's digital consumers and mobile users are actually in Asia Pacific, right? Again, as mentioned before, the region is heavily skewed toward young people who are willing to try new things. And most of the markets in Asia Pacific are growing. So there's just more economies, more population. 
um, more economic opportunity for everyone. So, you know, if there's one takeaway I want everyone to think about that Asia Pacific has got lots of opportunities, but what you really need to think about when you come and enter the region is really truly understand what's the business objectives you're trying to achieve, right? Because if you're trying to grow users, you're trying to increase revenue or just trying to build reputation credit, like all those three things have different ways of communicating that, different strategies you want to think about, right? The worst thing is to come in thinking that, you know, the company wants you to build users and revenue when actually the company really just wants you from a business goal perspective is to lay the groundwork for policy yeah. communications, right? So those strategies are very different and just understanding, again, my tip is just understanding what and truly understand what is the business objective you want to achieve coming into Asia and I'll dictate which, which countries you go to and the strategies you want to take from a comms perspective. I love that, Dixon. I think, you know, I think that is um, doing comms in modern times is really to, to tie that back to business goals and, and really think through that. So thank you. Um, we have questions coming in. Um, so um, let's take a minute there. Um, what I'm going to do is read the questions aloud and Dixon, Aline or, or Amy, um, you know, whichever one of you are, or few of you that want to address it, please feel free to jump in. The first one is, um, Really, how do you educate your teams outside of the APAC region on the fact that APAC is not just one country? So what three things will you basically say to help headquarters, for example, understand that there are many markets, cultures, traditions, and things like that? Anyone want to take this one? I'm happy. I'm happy to go. I think, you know, it's it's crucial and so helpful to um, invest in a little bit of educational training so to speak you can you can hire an agency if you don't have the capabilities in-house to do a one two hour workshop with your employees with your management your stakeholders on cross-cultural understanding it's it's so interesting so insightful it takes a two-hour workshop um, you can find really good agencies that do that and it's so helpful in terms of business success and, and, you know, launch this successfully. I would always advise people to do this. Yeah. I, Dixon, Amy, you're good on this one? Amy, do you want to say anything? Otherwise, I, I'll give two cents for No, okay. Yeah, so, you know, I think as, um, as communicators, you know, obviously employee communication is super important for us as well, right? And so just like what Aline said, um, educating the where the majority of the population sits. Again, I work for many American companies, so it's in the US, uh, but using like all hands, doing country spotlights is a good way to get people to understand what the opportunities in the, in the market that we operate in. I do feel that a lot of people in the home market are very curious about where we're opening offices, the opportunities we have. And so I think that curiosity lends its way to, you know, having us do presentations about certain markets, trends, even you look at the metrics, especially if you're seeing user growth, revenue growth in the market, why is that happening, right? And getting the market research team to actually dig into it as well and presenting those findings to an employee audience is a great way to obviously pique their interest, but also a way to you know, open the doors, right? With senior leaders, right? Um, the C-suite about why they should be thinking about investing in these certain markets. Thank you. All very useful uh, tips um, for today. There's more questions coming in, so I'm going to just tick them off. Um, Asia is the home for, you know, of course, different uh, cultural norms and values. How do you ensure that comm strategy are culturally sensitive while still aligning to the brand's global message? Um, anyone want to take this one? Again, I think it ties back to the advice to really partner with local people, be it an agency who is very familiar already with the local um, subletties and, 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 you know, what's actually, what can be done, what shouldn't be done, how it should be done. I think you need support. You can't just, you know, know it just because. So, uh, yes, again, you know, an agency might be really helpful to guide you through what you need to consider, also relate that and tie it back to your business goals as just elaborated. I think you you have to involve local stakeholders. Yeah, I think um, um, I, I also want to move on to the next question here where it is um, really talking about socials, um, digital basically and separating that from comms. 
um, especially in a time where PR folks have focused so much on integration. So the question here is, does a fully integrated approach work in Asia? And Dixon, I know just a, a while back, you know, you you mentioned um, that you know sometimes there's different entities internally that manages kind of digital apart from comms. Do you have an opinion on this? Yeah. So uh, I think specifically for the Asia region, right? Uh, the integration is very important. Uh, but I'm also not advocating that social that that comms people run social media channels. Like we did that <laughs> at Twitter when we first started because we we're the first people on the ground. We had people in market. But being a good social media channel requires content and really understanding what the nuances are for the, the voice, right? And so you need a full-time person for that, right? Um, I guess what I'd say is, uh, um, you know, each market, again, is very different in terms of which the social media platforms um, resonate the most with people, right? So you just need to figure that out, again, with the agency who can support you, on which of the platforms, like like what Aline said, you know, Line is very important in in Japan, right? Um, you know, uh, you look at other markets like Kakao in Korea, right? Um, Facebook and WhatsApp are very big in India, right? So, but working closely with them is super important, and making sure that the messaging is is on track uh, and that's aligned, because there are there are times when, for example, the story starts on social, right? It comes back to traditional media. And so you just have to be aligned on that. Sometimes the social media people can tell you something brewing online on, on the social media platforms that you can then get ahead of on the comm side, especially if there's issues or crisis you have to manage. So that alignment is very, very important. Thanks. Um, Amy, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like you may have an opinion on this one. And OceanX must have considered integrating or separating and whatnot. What's your take? We have. I think um, for us, communication, marketing, social media all have to work in lockstep. And what's what's sort of stood out to me in the Asian markets that we've worked in thus far is that in many cases, the um, social media spaces can operate as sort of a media channel, um, a media channel that we can build a relationship with and, and share our message through almost like traditional media. And so I think it sort of necessitates a bringing together of these groups internally so that your strategy and approach and your message resonates across any external touch point that you're pursuing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. We have a couple more questions, um, um, guys. So I'm going to just run through it. One, I think that always comes up for people, you know, with our background in comms, which is measurement. So the question here is, what are measurement best practices, especially when you're reporting back to the offices outside of the region? Um, you know, so what's, what's everyone's take on this one? Aline, do you have a honestly? Yeah, I'm just thinking opinion. right now. <laughs> I'm thinking honestly. I'm not sure if there's are if there are really like you know huge differences in measurements when it comes to you know successfully communicating or marketing in in Asia versus US or Europe. I, well, I've, I've also I used to work with with large MNCs, right? So I I, I didn't encounter really some huge differences that would advise on when measuring success but maybe someone else has a different experience. Yeah, maybe for from our standpoint, the size of the markets is something that I've had to do some education on. It just, you know, New York campaigns, it's the center of US media, Sing and that's a gigantic country. When we're doing Singapore media, it's a much smaller media landscape. And so yeah. I do think that it's uh, an opportunity to, explain the cultural differences and help understand the landscape a little bit better because you're not going to necessarily see the same kinds of numbers that you might see in other markets. Um, you maybe want to lean more into the quality over the quantity. Yeah. So I think there's just a little bit of that that comes into play, but otherwise it's it's the same things that make you successful, I think, from a comms perspective in terms of um, the KPIs you should be measuring. It's just about how much you should expect. Yeah, 
Dixon, I see your mic is off. You have an opinion, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, just, just because obviously I'm in Global HQ as well. Yeah. And I've seen this for regions. So there's definitely a focus on quality, right? I think everywhere around the world, you know, if you got 300 stories in tier two media versus one, two great stories in tier one, you take the one to two in tier one, right? So I think that's what I always advocate is like, um, focus on the quality. That's more important than the quantity. And the message pull through is something that's super important, right? Again, whether US headquarters or region, uh, again, what Aline and Amy have said, they're very common stats, but I think just the quality of the of the uh, metrics and, and the story that, that you're trying to pull through is important um, no matter where you are in the world. Sounds good. So um, we're coming up to the hour, but um, I would like to pose two more last questions and then we can do a wrap up. Um, so the first one is actually um, targeted at Amy. Um, Amy, the question here is, I think you're the only one at the table who's had an ex interesting experience of launching a movie or ocean conservation in APAC. What, is that ex what in that experience was unique for you? And were there differences in doing that in the U.S. as opposed to in APAC? And what stood out? Um, thank you for the question. It's it's niche, right? <laughs> Launching an ocean conservation movie anywhere. It's uh, the natural history documentary is a small, sort of a small entertainment market. So um, what was unique? Well, I would say that one thing that was unique about launching um, Ocean Explorers, we're talking about Ocean Explorers, which was a National yes. Geographic series that we uh, released in, in August. And we just held the um, premiere for Southeast Asia aboard the research vessel that we operate, the, the Ocean Explorer, similar naming. So that is a very unique experience from any movie premiere standpoint <laughs> in terms of being able to actually watch a film aboard the set of the film. <laughs> um, although that that's just a very unique thing. Uh, one thing that came out for me though, that is that the film really is about work that happened in the Atlantic Ocean. And so I think there's been some work that I've done to make sure that the team understands that while this is a very exciting moment for Ocean X, it does lack that local relevancy um, that would make Singapore and the, the Southeast Asian market really connect to the film. So that has been, you know, some communication that we've had to do internally to understand that this may resonate deeply um, for many people who love the ocean, but it's going to resonate most closely for people where they're going to see their regions explored. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So one last question and we'll wrap up. And this was originally posed, uh, uh, targeted at Dixon, but I think this is a good point to end on, right? Which is, um, um, uh, this person would love to know um, our thoughts on tips that you have and what it takes to convince global sea level leaders to invest in APAC. Um, and so uh, what's everyone's take? How do we convince headquarters or, you know, the um, to, to uh, put mo money here in our region? Dixon, maybe you take this first. Sure, I'm happy to, yeah. So, you know, like our function is the value of function has, has elevated because we're the most cross-functional of all functions, right? We touch everything except maybe HR, right? So I think the what you have to do is build a business proposition, right? A business case for why you want to go into a certain market or a region. And that means that you've got to step up as a communicator. You've got to go talk to the finance people. Let's look at the metrics, right? Where are we seeing user revenue growth growing? Go talk to the um, chief legal officer, the... Um, Public policy folks and say, hey, where do you think we're having the most issues or anticipated issues that come out that we need to think about doing communications work, right? Um, go talk to the market research people, right? And think about, okay, can you do any research in this market for us that we can use as data points, talk to C-suite and put that business proposition together. Go talk to your CCMO, CFO, whoever it is, maybe CEO, you have an opportunity to talk to them as well. I think this is the reason why we think we should do this, right? Yeah. I don't advocate doing the entire region because that's a huge amount of investment, but choose one market, right? That, uh, that's my suggestion. Choose one market you think there's really good fundamentals. You've got a lot of data to back it up and go talk to C-suite and see where they're willing to experiment. And once you build that credibility and do it well, then you can expand to other markets, right? Obviously, yeah. if you're a big company, you got a lot of resources, um, 
then you can think about more markets. But sometimes people just want to see prove it first and yeah, work with cross functional partners to enter the market. It's not just a comms initiative. Yeah. And what sometimes, IT. yeah, what's sometimes yeah. also very powerful, and um, I think it's important to consider this as well, is to show the C suit what happens if we don't do it, right? So what, what's the risk or what our competitors are doing or just for our business, what happens if we don't go, let's say, into the Indonesian market? So I think that's also very powerful to play this card. All right. Um, if we're good, um, I want to thank um, Dixon and Amy Aline for being on the call today as our panelists. Um, and thank you for everyone to, uh, for being on the call. Um, a shout out that, you know, we could go on and on for, for, for years on this topic, but for those of you who are in the Asia time zone, we do have a session with a different set of panelists for later today. It's at 5 p.m. Um, feel free to join us there. And um, with that, you know, a final shout out would be, if you want more, please go download on our PRCA website for the Asia Go to Primer. And we look forward to seeing everyone on the next panel discussion. So thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you. Thanks, See you everybody. next time.